What's up guys? My name is Paul Claremont. Welcome to my channel. Today we're going to talk about a teaching in Theravada Buddhism called the Upadana Khanda, the five clinging aggregates. And this is a powerful psychological teaching where the Buddha explains the mechanics of how we create the stress and mental pain in our lives so that we can overcome it and live happier. And as the name clinging aggregates suggests, there's two parts. What is this? <laughs> there's two parts to this teaching. The foundation is the five aggregates, um, where the Buddha categorized all phenomena, both physical and mental, into five groups called the khandas. And the second part of this teaching is about a mental action called clinging and upadana, and this is responsible for creating mental pain. The teaching of the five aggregates by itself has a lot of value for spiritual development and the Buddhist path. So in this video, I'm just going to briefly explain what they are for context and instead focus on the psychology of clinging. So to start off, it's important to know that the Buddha equates this teaching to the first noble truth, dukkha. And dukkha is a word that we translate as stress and suffering, but it actually encompasses the whole spectrum of mental pain from just ordinary dissatisfaction to anger, sadness, anxiety, all the way up to actual suffering. So in the sutra where he defines dukkha, called Diga Nikaya 22, he sums everything up by saying, in short, the five clinging aggregates are stress. And this is profound because now instead of just subjective descriptions of what stress can look like, the Buddha gives us a framework that we can investigate and work with to gradually solve the problem. Whether our scope is just personal development or to eventually attain the ultimate happiness of nirvana. The reason for this is that the first noble truth defines the problem we're trying to solve, the dissatisfaction and mental pain in our lives, and suggests that if we want to overcome it, then we have to understand how we're creating it. And the Upadana Khanda gives us a tool for doing that. Next, the five aggregates, the five categories of phenomena. These are form, feeling, perception, formations or fabrications, and consciousness. Now form includes all physical phenomena. So the body, all the external objects we see, and the unorganized matter that composes them. The next four khandas are mental. So feeling. Feeling entails sensations in the body at the five senses, as well as feeling within the mind, what we call emotion. And these can be pleasurable, painful, or neutral. Perception is the mind's function of recognizing and distinguishing between things, applying labels to them. Formations or fabrications, these are intentions. And the reason they're called formations is because they create activity at different levels, bodily, verbal, and mental. Bodily, this is moving the body and influencing how it feels. Verbal, this is forming speech and thoughts. And mental, this is creating different mental states by changing perception and emotion. And the fifth aggregate, consciousness. Its basic definition is awareness of sensory experience. Awareness at the six senses, where the mind is the sixth sense. The five groups of phenomena are actually fine on their own. They don't cause or force stress upon us. They can only act as stimuli for us to create stress for ourselves. For example, when you attain nirvana, which is the complete realization of your true nature and results in the permanent end of suffering, you're still alive. You still experience the aggregates the body, feelings, and perception, and so on. But now they no longer have an impact on you, even if there's intense bodily pain or unfortunate external circumstances. You no longer create suffering out of them. What this means is that the phenomena we experience were never the problem, but rather how our minds relate to that experience based on our beliefs and perspectives. So this is where the concept of clinging, upadana, comes in. You can think of clinging as attachment, needing things to be a certain way as a requisite or permission for peace of mind. And the underlying mechanism of this attachment 
is that we're unconsciously viewing the five khandhas as this is mine, this is what I am, and this is myself. So the two underlying core components there are identification, which means creating a sense of self, the idea that I am this body, this consciousness, these memories, and so on. And the second core component is the idea of mine, that things can belong to that self. And this can apply to blatant external things like people, possessions, and circumstances, but it can also apply to internal things like um, sensations in the body, emotions, views, and memories. That's more of a technical explanation for what clinging is, but what that amounts to in a practical sense is needing things to be a certain way to have peace of mind or happiness. I'll give you a basic analogy. You can think of a settler who comes upon a new land, sticks a symbolic flag in the ground, and claims that area as their property. Once they create the idea that it's theirs, they start believing that's intrinsically true. And then they also want their property to remain the way that they prefer. So if something impinges upon that, then they're going to get upset or distressed. That's attachment. However, the important thing to realize is our idea of ownership is just contrived and notional. It doesn't actually correspond to reality. The land doesn't recognize ownership. It doesn't start forming an invisible boundary in line with what you've decided in your head. And the same goes for any of our possessions. The proof for that is that we can't really stop external things from messing with what we say is ours. For example, a swarm of beavers could chop down your trees. The natives could come force you off of your land, since it was probably theirs anyway. Or a sudden storm could ruin your beloved pastoral cabin. This shows us that right from the start, we can't ever truly own anything except in a conventional societal sense. The problem is, we forget this and start depending on our illusory idea that something can actually be mine. But what if nothing ever really goes wrong? Does it even matter? Even if that were possible, time is the final gatekeeper that's going to show us clinging is a flawed mindset because eventually everything degenerates and changes against our wishes. The last key thing to notice in this example is that those same land resources we're upset about losing were not too long ago just neutral and meaningless trees. We didn't care about them and we had no attachment to them. Our anger and sadness about losing them could only arise after we arrived and constructed the belief that this is my plot of land. What this shows is that the problem of stress can only arise if we've first created the idea of claiming something and requiring it to remain the way we want. So you can apply this analogy to any of the conditions in your life, not just the blatant external things like people, possessions, habits and situations, but also extended to your own sense of self based on what's happening in the body and in the mind. To phrase the concept of clinging generally, when our preferred set of conditions gets disturbed in some unfavorable way, whether internally in the body mind or in the external world, we react with some degree of mental pain, disappointment, frustration, fear, distress, etc. But this isn't to say that we can't still have preferences. The solution isn't to pretend we wouldn't rather be healthy than sick or have pizza instead of day old fish that's been left out on the counter. The idea is that stress only arises when, when we cling to those preferences, when we lament the disappearance of good things or the presence of unwanted things. This leads me to my next point. Now, to help you more clearly perceive clinging within yourself, in the same sutra I mentioned in the beginning, the Buddha provides a three-part three part formula for what clinging looks like in action, the ways it manifests as stress when undesirable changes come into our lives. This is dukkha, mental pain, that results from not getting what is wanted, being separated from what is loved, and being joined with what is unloved. Number one, this would be like bringing home the sub sandwich you ordered, only to realize they forgot your favorite ingredient and side order of french fries. Losing an important sports match, whether it's your own team or your favorite team on TV. Receiving a rejection letter from a college you really wanted to attend. 
So you become unhappy because you got a result that wasn't what you were expecting or hoping for. Number two, this could be breaking up with a romantic partner, losing a family member or friend, or having an expensive possession break, get lost, or stolen. You're being separated from the thing you love and value. Number three, being joined with what is unloved. This could be like you're walking your dog through your neighborhood and it smells like garbage for some reason. Um, someone was rude and condescending to you at work. Or maybe you're enjoying your day in the park and some shady guy comes and starts loitering next to you. These are the ways you can see attachment operating within you. The negative emotions that arise within your mind indicate that it's there. But it's not that you automatically have to react to these situations with some form of stress. These are just the default reactions that we have before we start the process of actively and consciously training our minds to respond differently. The final question is, what do we do about attachment? How do we ultimately solve the problem of Upadana? Well, just learning about it is helpful, but if you really wanna transform yourself and elevate your life, then it's essential to have a strategy, a progressive path for developing yourself. Because what we're dealing with are mental tendencies and trained ways of reacting. So the way to solve them is through practice and retraining the mind over time. In general, what we're doing is internalizing our happiness, not letting it be dictated by external circumstances, and instead learning to create it ourselves through the mental skill that we develop. And you can do this to whatever degree you want, whether it's personal development or spiritual development. But in Buddhism, for those seeking enlightenment, the complete end of stress, the Buddha prescribes the Eightfold Noble Path. So you overcome the first noble truth, Dukkha, with the fourth noble truth, Magga, the path. So there you have it, guys. That's my video about the five Upadhanakanda. If you're interested in more of the technical Buddhist details, about this subject, be sure to check out the essay I'm going to link below, written by a Buddhist master named Tanasaru Bhikkhu. And at the end of the essay, he even links, well, he doesn't link, he just he lists all the original relevant sutras so that you can check them out for yourself. So if you liked this video, be sure to let me know by hitting the like button, subscribe for more spiritual topics, and hit the bell icon so you get notifications for the video. And if this video helps you achieve enlightenment, be sure to let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching. This was Paul Claremont. I'll see you next time. Peace.